Iran, the ancient superpower. Few regions have confounded, confused, or captivated the world as much or as long as the Middle East. Sitting at the crux of Eurasian trade for thousands of years, Persia was ancient Greece's existential threat. Carthage and Venetia traded, raided, and warred with Rome. The Moorish conquest of Spain, the Crusades, the Silk Road, the Spice Trade, the Ottoman Empire, the Global War on Terror. Part of the reason the Middle East features so prominently and so often in Western war is that it is right there. Athens and Rome had more contact and arguably more in common with the world of the Eastern Mediterranean than they ever did or would with Berlin, Paris, or London. Like it or not, this region is a central piece of the West's collective cultural history. Another reason is money. Before deep water navigation, much of the trade between Europe and Asia relied on routes through the Middle East. For the relatively short historical period of steam travel and coal, the region languished until the discovery of oil. The dissolution of empires and the massive injection of wealth into countries built literally on sand made everyone who relied on fossil fuels a party to the sometimes esoteric and often violent disputes that still define the region today. As hard as it is to believe, the American-led order has kept most of these disputes limited to a slow burn. As the United States started to step back from the world stage, the Middle East was the first to descend into disorder, and the region has precious little in the way of stability to look forward to. Part of why the Middle East always seems so chaotic is that it's next to impossible to establish continuity. It comes down to water, or more accurately, the lack thereof. What rain the region receives occurs seasonally in a scant handful of highlands, most of which are too steep to be particularly useful as living space. The resulting streams and rivers follow narrow courses with minimal downstream inflows. Miss those, and oases are the only other water source. Nearly all the region's agriculture must be irrigated, and most of its population clusters tightly around whatever water is available. Dictated by that most essential of resources, this settlement pattern forces a base, visceral competition upon the region. One seasonal hiccup in the delicate water supply, and local civilizations are forced into a blizzard of raiding and counter-raiding. Civilization falls apart. The nature of the region's terrain doesn't help. Nearly all of the Middle East is flat, open, arid lands, or hard desert. Throughout, there are painfully few geographic barriers a culture can hide behind. Desert communities can fall with a single raid. Coastal communities can be subjugated, or wiped out, by a single foreign vessel. Oasis cities can be besieged and starved. It doesn't take a horde to sweep across the flats of Mesopotamia and force a flag change. Checkpoints like Istanbul sit at maritime and or land-based crossroads, attract a lot of attention, and tend to change hands from time to time. Iran is different in every conceivable way, but it all boils down to one factor. Populated Iran is a fused, sprawling mountain system. Iran's Zagros mountain chain fills the country's entire southwestern third, while the Elburz dominates the northern third. The contemporary capital of Tehran sits on a plateau where the two chains meet. With an average peak elevation of 10,000 feet, the two chains not only force out fairly reliable rainfall, but their valley floors tend to be above 3,000 feet. Unlike nearly everywhere else in the region, it actually rains in Iran, where people live, and that changes everything. Direct rainfall enables agriculture without necessarily requiring irrigation. Lower labor requirements free workers to do other things, like going to school, or practicing a trade, or waging war. Culture here has roots stretching back 5,000 years. 
mountain living has other advantages. Anyone wanting to invade Iran must fight their way uphill into the Persian core and batter through every single mountain lime. This defensibility shapes Persia's participation in international affairs. Iran isn't a destination, but instead a nut of difficult territory that must be bypassed by those in Asia or Europe who want to trade with each other. Since passing through Persia is so difficult, trade in all areas tends to flow around Persia whenever possible, preferring either the dangerous, open, pirate-ridden seas of the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea, or the flatland route through brigand-rich Central Asia. The only exception is the Silk Road. Persia did play host to one major route. From the Central Asian steppes and deserts, traders would enter Persia from the northeast and drop down to Persia's coastal strip on the southern shore of the Caspian Sea. Take a look at Google Earth. It's the only flat green place in the country. Such trade came into Persia's sphere of influence, enabling the Persians to take a big fat bite out of it, but did so without unduly undermining local culture or establishing economic dependency or strategic vulnerability. Unlike the dozens of city-states and empires that have risen and fallen throughout the Middle East, the Persians have art and history and culture that isn't short-lived or incidental or fused with foreign practice but instead anchored in millennia of continuity. The Persian language and Persian customs, conservatively, date back hundreds of generations. Persian continuity enabled a local economy far more sophisticated than the pearl harvesters of the Persian Gulf's southwestern shore, or the caravan towns of the Syrian interior, or the grunt farmers of Mesopotamia or the Nile. No one horse town, the Persian economic system is thick with variety, literacy, and technical skill. The Persians don't simply look down on their neighbors, both literally and figuratively, from their mountain fastness. From time to time, the Persians boil out and conquer them all. In past incarnations, the Persian empires have expanded as far as Thrace, the Northern Caucasus, the Aral Sea, the Hindu Kush, the Indus, the Nile, and the Cyrenaica. To put that into contemporary names, at Persia's maximum historical extent, it absorbed most or all of contemporary Azerbaijan, Armenia, Georgia, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Great Jordan, Syria, Israel, Lebanon, Egypt, Turkey, and Bulgaria, along with big bites of Uzbekistan, Libya, and Greece. The Persians have had their highs and lows, just like everyone else, but most notable is the fact that the lack of local competition met with the Persian empires of the past didn't so much rise and fall as expand and contract. Only on rare occasions did the Persian core itself fall. Today the Persians are under only their seventh governing system since the rise of the Achaemenid Empire. Americans, who are still on their first governing system, might feel a bit smug at that, but that Achaemenid Empire first rose 26 centuries ago. These folks have some serious state power.